True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. So today's episode is called The Long Island Serial Killer, but we're not really talking about that killer. We're talking more about his victims and the people who were affected by this killer who is actually still on the loose, hasn't been found. Long Island's South Shore has a really dark and tragic secret in this. The infamous Long Island Serial Killer also known as the Gilgo Beach Killer or the Craigslist Ripper. This still unidentified killer is responsible for the murder of over 10 women and one man, all whose remains were dumped along the Ocean Parkway over a span of 20 years. In December of 2010, the Suffolk County Police Department was conducting a search for Shannon Gilbert, a 24-year-old sex worker, Shannon lived in Jersey City, and she had been missing since fleeing the home of a client that May. While conducting that search in the dunes of Ocean Parkway, police officer Malia and his German shepherd Blue found the skeletal remains of a woman stuffed into a burlap sack. But these remains were not Shannon Gilbert's. The search expanded then, and two days later, they uncovered three more bodies, all female, that had been dumped in the thick vegetation along the road. The four bodies were identified within weeks. All four of these women were revealed to have been escorts or sex workers who had advertised their services on Craigslist or Backpage. Six more sets of remains were found in March and April of 2011. This gruesome series of deaths was really unheard of on Long Island. As the police widened the scope of their search, they continued to find more remains. The FBI eventually became involved and speculated that this alleged killer was someone familiar with law enforcement techniques. But finding the killer has proven to be impossible. Psychologists have put together a profile and several suspects have been looked at, but the case does remain unsolved. So join us today at The Quiet End for a discussion of these murders. We're going to take a heartbreaking look at the victims and what turned their lives in a direction where they became vulnerable to this serial killer. But first, as always, let's start out with a beer. Okay, we have a beer. It is from Finback Brewing in Queens, New York. It's also done in collaboration with Jay Wakefield Brewing in Miami. The title is Smooth Beats Miami. This is an interesting beer. It's my first coconut IPA. I don't know if you've ever heard of a coconut IPA. I hadn't. I haven't. So it's a hazy gold color, thick white head, tons of lace, very pretty looking beer. And you get this real big aroma of coconut and some fruit. Then the taste is coconut, up forward, and pineapple. So it's a pretty sweet, not very hoppy beer. Easy to drink. Uh, I'm just not sure about a coconut IPA. (laughs) <laughs> probably need to try some more. Well, we like coconut water, so it's probably good. Let's yeah, I mean, I, try. I, I wasn't sitting there saying, blah, I feel like I'm going to throw up. It's just a, a different IPA than I've ever had. Right. All right. Well, let's open it up and try it. We'll share it around with folks, okay? Okay, sure. So down to the quiet end we go. And we'll plunk down and open the beer and talk to our folks. Okay. This is really, really a sad case, and it brings back a lot of feelings about how women can be treated and about poverty in the country. There's just a lot of issues that come up in my mind when we're talking about this case. But for now, we're going to focus on these individual lives and what happened. To start out, let's talk about the disappearance of Shannon Gilbert. So in the early morning of May 1st, 2010, Shannon was last seen running off a road at Oak Beach, Long Island. This is a private gated community, and there's no police patrols out there. So Shannon was an escort who advertised on Craigslist. That night, she met a friendly-seeming man named Joe Brewer. 
Shannon left her home just after midnight. Her driver took her to the client's home at 2 a.m. and waited outside in the car. After being inside for three hours, she made a 23-minute call to 911. And on the call, she said, they're trying to kill me. Now, it was 4.51 when that call came in. And two male voices are heard in the background. Joseph Brewer, the client, and Michael Pock, who is her driver. Police couldn't respond to Shannon's call because she couldn't tell them where she was. According to police, Shannon sounded panicked and irrational. But we don't have any way of knowing if she was having a mental crisis, if she was simply afraid, or if she might have been on drugs. Yeah, now the client, 46-year-old Joseph Brewer, called Shannon's driver and asked him to get Shannon out of his house. But Shannon was in hysterics, and she ran off, refusing to get into the car with her driver. At about 5 a.m., Shannon was outside screaming on the doorstep of Gus Coletti, a retired insurance fraud investigator. Gus let her in, seeing that she needed help, and he called 911. Shannon was still holding her cell phone with the 911 operator on that line, and that operator overheard Shannon's interactions with Gus. Gus told Shannon that the police were on the way, and he suggested that she should stay and wait at his house. But she wouldn't. She took off. So Gus went outside, and he saw an Asian man in a black SUV stopped in front of his house. This was Shannon's driver, Michael Pack. Gus wondered if that was who Shannon was running away from, which would make sense. He saw Shannon hiding beneath a boat in his yard, and when she ran off from the boat, Michael Pack followed her in the SUV, and he said something to Gus like, you shouldn't have called the police. She's going to get into trouble. And Gus was having none of that. He said, well, I did call the police. So at 5.20 a.m., Shannon ran to the nearby house of a resident named Barbara Brennan. Shannon banged on the door and Barbara called 911. When police arrived at 5.40 a.m., Shannon was gone. So they just decided they would believe that she had left with her driver and not look into it at all. Yeah, and Michael Pock would say later that he followed Shannon and looked for her for about an hour, and he never found her. So this to me is ridiculous. Why would you leave after an hour? The whole point of him being there is to keep her safe. He's like her bodyguard, really, as well as her driver. So to me, the fact that he left after an hour is just really bad. It makes him look bad. It wasn't the appropriate thing to do, and he really let her down, in my opinion. Well, yeah, I mean, he could say... I looked for her for a while. I couldn't find her. That's that. But she is off far away from home. I mean, it's reminding me of Maitrese Richardson now, because she's off there where she doesn't know anybody. She's in some kind of mental state, no matter what's causing it. And then he just leaves and goes home. That's very rude, very inconsiderate, very selfish. The 911 operator and the local police who Gus Coletti had called weren't aware of Shannon's 911 call because her call had been transferred to the New York State Police when she couldn't tell the operator where she was. She said she thought she was at Jones Beach, which is still quite a ways away. So it would actually take as long as a month before police made the connection between Shannon's 911 call and the missing persons report filed by her family for her. She was reported missing two days after her disappearance when her worried boyfriend called her sister's. Her sisters went out to the area and knocked on doors, but no one said that they had seen her. So why was Shannon out there that night working as an escort or a prostitute? That's the big question, I think. There were many things that led her to this dangerous life. According to her sisters, Shannon was trying to make money and make a better life for herself. And that's hard to do on a normal, everyday, minimum wage job. Since Shannon was in the 8th grade and performed in her school's production of Annie, she loved to perform and she had dreams of modeling, singing, and acting professionally. Shannon's mother had left Shannon's father when Shannon was just 5 years old. She had two younger sisters, too, 4-year-old Sherry and 3-year-old Sarah, and they would never see their father again. Their mother, Mary, told the girls that he was a heroin addict, and that was the end of that. Yeah, so who knows what happened to him? Well, yeah, we only have one side of the story. 
But their lives became more difficult when Mary started seeing a guy named David. He was the father of Mary's fourth daughter, and that was Stevie. Shannon's sister Sherry, who was about five years old at that time, remembered a lot of fighting after Stevie's birth. She would recall how she and Shannon hid beneath the kitchen table as plates of food were thrown and broken against the wall and the floor. Now Mary's mother called the police when she learned about the fights. David went to jail and all four of Mary's daughters were placed in foster care. So Mary was really angry at her mother for calling the authorities and she didn't get custody back of her girls for nearly two years. Yeah, but I would say good for Mary's mom. Absolutely. I mean, nothing was going on from Mary's point of view, right? She wasn't calling the police or asking for help. No, Mary had her issues. So, mom did the right thing. I agree. Anyway, after the the family was reunited, Mary moved them to Ellenville, New York. Pretty small town. People's opinions of Mary in Ellenville were not very good. She was looked at as a tough woman who neglected her children. Shannon often ran off with friends for days at a time, and her mother never looked for her. Yeah, it didn't take long living in Ellenville before Shannon, then only about seven years old, was returned to the foster care system. For six years, she lived near Mary, but in a series of foster homes. And Shannon went to the same school as her sisters and hung out with a lot of the same kids, but she didn't live with her sisters or her mother. Mary never explained to anyone outside of the family why Shannon didn't live at home. Then when Shannon was 12, she was diagnosed as bipolar, but she never took her medicine because she didn't like the side effects. Mary said that foster care was the best option for Shannon because she just couldn't control her. Yeah, I'm getting the impression that Mary has limited means, limited coping skills. And it was just easier to kind of dump Shannon on the social system. Well, I hate to use the word dump, but there were certainly some issues with Mary and her mothering. And the medication that you take for bipolar disorder does have a fair amount of side effects. And probably at least half the people that take the medication at one time or another stop taking it because of the side effects. Yeah, and I know it's tough when you have a kid with something like that, but I think when they're 12, you really need to be pretty prudent about making sure they take their medicine. Well, yes. Yeah. Again, that gets back to mom's parenting skills. Yeah. And I don't want to, you know, demonize the mother because she had a lot to deal with. Oh, she did. But let's just say the home life was far from ideal. Fair description. So Mary said Shannon was out of control, but other people had a different story. Shannon told friends that her mom cared more about her boyfriends than she did about her own children. And according to Sherry, her sister, Shannon and Mary's boyfriend didn't get along, and Shannon was sent away because of him. She said that Mary was oblivious to the abuse that her boyfriend perpetrated on them, and she only learned about it when the girls spoke up years later. But then at that point, Mary did support her daughters when they accused him, so you have to give her credit for that. He went to jail and ended up dying a few years later. And to her sisters and friends, Shannon was a smart, friendly, energetic, and very talented young lady. To them, Mary was Shannon's biggest problem growing up. So she graduated from high school and moved away from Ellenville. And Shannon lived with her grandmother for a while and actually began taking nursing classes. Then she worked at a hotel, a restaurant chain, and a secretary at a local school. And then she dropped out of college and quit the secretarial job because it was too boring. And then she left her grandmother's house because they had arguments about her staying out too late. So this is kind of a a similar spiral to mom heading downhill. And I think that her grandmother really tried, but it's hard to raise a kid as a grandmother. You know, you're getting older. You don't want to deal with all that. And this girl hadn't had any structure before that. Right. You know, we were just reading articles about that, about how more and more grandparents are raising their kids, grandkids, yeah, yeah. as their own children. And it ain't easy. No, I, just, I wouldn't want to do it. I mean, of course, I would do it if it was necessary, but that would be tough. There's a huge generation gap there, too, when you're talking about a grandparent raising a child. You're right about that. But I certainly give the grandparents that do it a lot of credit. 
So Shannon then moved to Jersey City, which was just across the river from Manhattan. That was in 2007. She really wanted to be a stage performer in New York, and she planned to audition for singing and acting jobs. And she also began taking college classes in psychology and writing. She was determined to follow her dreams and make a better life for herself. And when she didn't get as many auditions as she hoped for, that's when things kind of fell apart for her. She fell into the lure of making a lot of money, and the only way she could earn that was working as an escort or a sex worker. So she kind of saw that as her only option, which is really sad. But by working as an escort and making about $500 a night, she did have more freedom to pursue auditions, and she had enough money to support herself and help out her sisters. So there was a good side to it, at least the way she saw it but I don't think she realized how dangerous it really was. You know, not only physically dangerous from getting hurt, but I think it's psychologically dangerous to put yourself in that position. Would it be? I think it would be really hard. So at first, Shannon worked for an escort service. She met her boyfriend, Alex Diaz, through her job as an escort, and he was one of the drivers. They were really happy together, and they were both earning pretty good money. So they moved in together, and things seemed pretty good. But the escort business was busted by the police, and then Alex and Shannon were both out of a job. And after they lost their high-paying jobs, the relationship went right downhill. They started fighting, and Alex became physically abusive. According to the arrest record, Alex hit Shannon so hard that he shattered her jaw. She had to have surgery, and a titanium plate was put into her jaw, So she had a long recovery period. Yes, she did. But nevertheless, she stayed with Alex. She did. So then they're struggling to pay their bills. And then Shannon decided to advertise herself on Craigslist. And this way, she believed she could eliminate the middleman. She could make her own hours and keep all the money she earned. But she needed a driver to be safe. Yes, sometimes Alex was the driver, but when he wasn't, she hired a man named Michael Pack. He would take Shannon to meet with a client, and he'd wait in the car for her. This way, the client knew that she was brought there by someone, so she was less likely to get beaten or ripped off. Alex Diaz, the boyfriend, kissed Shannon goodnight on May 1st, 2010. This was a normal Friday night working for her. Her driver that night was Michael Pack. She'd gotten a call to go to a client at Oak Beach, and this was a place she'd never been to before. She left at midnight to meet the client, Joe Brewer. And after she ran off that night, her family and friends never saw her again. Alex spent the entire next day waiting for her to come home. She never returned, and by Sunday, he was worried enough to try calling her. But her phone was shut off, so he didn't know what to do next. He knew her driver's name, Michael Pack, but he didn't have a phone number for him. So finally, he went through Shannon's drawers and found a piece of paper with some phone numbers. He first called Michael, who seemed surprised to hear from him. And Alex was angry that the driver had abandoned her on Long Island. I think he was right about that. That was not a cool thing to do. But Michael told Alex what had happened. But nothing Michael was saying about her behavior that night sounded like Shannon to Alex. He thought it was all a little shady. But Michael was helpful. He tried to help Alex find her. So I think he did at least feel a little guilty about leaving her once he found out she hadn't made it home. Which, of course, any normal person would. You think? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Alex and Michael Pack found six nearby hospitals online and four police stations. They called them all giving Shannon's name and a description of her, but no one had seen her. So Alex then asked Michael to connect him with the person who hired Shannon and spoke with Joe Brewer over the phone. So Brewer laughed at him, basically saying, Oh, man, that's your job. You should know where she's at. And he got defensive when he was asked questions, and his story didn't sound believable to Alex. Michael said she'd been at Brewer's house for three hours, so what would have set her off after that? all that time had gone by? Well, that's a curious part about it, because that's a long time to be in his house. And you think if something was going to go wrong, it would have gone wrong sooner. You would. Now, she didn't show any signs of being beaten, according to Michael. 
but she was terrified. She was hiding behind a couch, hysterical. Yeah, could she have taken something? Some drugs or something? I suppose. We don't know, because she was never found, so we have no idea. No, and, I and mean, we're just going on what is given as a history. Exactly. So he could have given her some kind of drug. She could have been on drugs. But according to Alex, you know, she'd use drugs. It's not like she never used drugs. So she didn't normally act that strange when she took them. Could she have been having a bad trip? Well, maybe, but she was making a lot of sense, really. She wasn't saying random things. So it's very curious what set her off to go running out that night. Yeah, it really is. We know... From what we know, she was okay on the trip out, right? Yes, exactly. And Pac didn't say anything was amiss. Nope. Uh, and he was sitting in the car waiting for her. There didn't seem to be any problems until three hours into things, and then something happened. Yeah, exactly. So together, Alex and Joe Brewer went and filed a report. The Suffolk County police officers didn't seem to take them seriously, though. She was an escort, a prostitute. So they just weren't giving her the kind of attention that they would give other people. There's always that bias. Yeah, we've been through that before. Yes. The marginalized people. When Alex said he was from Jersey City, they told him, well, anyway, you need to go file the report there. So the next day, he did drive back out to Oak Beach with a photo of Shannon. And he made it to the gate where a truck pulled up and stopped. And a middle-aged man, kind of chunky but friendly, got out of the truck. Alex noticed he had a limp and a prosthetic leg, and he introduced himself as Dr. Peter Hackett. The doctor listened to Alex and wrote down some of what Alex was saying in a little notebook. He told Alex he knew nothing about what had happened to Shannon, but he said, We're going to help you out with this case. I used to work with the police, so we're going to call them, and we're going to have this whole place searched. And he was true to his word because later that day, helicopters were searching above Oak Beach, but they found nothing on that search. So that evening, Alex filed a missing persons report for Shannon in Jersey City. He also let her family know what was going on. And he told the police that Shannon was bipolar and she had been known to use cocaine, marijuana, and also some prescription drugs. And Mary Gilbert, mom, had trouble remembering all the details, but she did say that Dr. Hackett called her in the days following Shannon's disappearance. Now, this was before she understood that Shannon was really missing. And the content of the phone call, as she recalled it, was very strange. He said his name was Dr. Peter Hackett, he lived in Oak Beach, Long Island, and that he ran a home for wayward girls. And according to Mary, he told her that he had treated Shannon but she had left his house. That's odd. It's very odd, and she said that she remembered him saying to her that he had seen Shannon that night, and that she was incoherent, and he took her into his home to rehab her. And then the next day, he said a driver came and picked her up. And then he asked Mary if she had seen her since. And eventually, of course, Mary would be questioned about this call, and Hackett denied calling Mary at first. But Shannon's sister, Sherry, was there for the call right next to her mom, and she confirmed what Mary had heard. And then Hackett would later admit to the call, but he never admitted to seeing or to treating Shannon in any way. He only admitted to the call when phone records were provided. Exactly. And there were neighbors that said that he would treat them. He gave someone a steroid injection. He'd given people prescriptions. So he did treat neighbors. Yeah, well, he was a former ER doc, so he could do that. I don't know about running a a rehab center. Well, he claims to never have said that. Yeah. And, you know, we don't have a recording of the call, so it could have been a misunderstanding on Mary's part. It could have been. But there are some things about Hackett that are suspicious. But over time, there were others, including his neighbors at Oak Beach, who believed that he did know more about what had happened to Shannon than he would admit. Helped along by pressure from Shannon's family, the search led authorities to find 10 sets of human remains off Ocean Parkway. 10. That's just hard to imagine. Well, they didn't find them all at once. Well, no, but they found a lot of bodies. Someone was killing people and dumping bodies there. They did. And it's really horrifying that one of them was a toddler. 
Another one of the bodies was an Asian man dressed in women's clothing, which makes you wonder if this was a transgender person who was working as an escort. We don't know. No, we don't. We do know that the bodies that had been identified, all of them were sex workers. Half of the remains found during the searches were identified, and all five were young women in their 20s who did work in the sex trade. The police searched Oak Beach for Shannon again after some data they found from aerial photography. They searched the marsh at the center of Oak Beach, and deep into the marsh they found a purse, a shoe, a phone, and a pair of jeans. Now, we must make note of the fact that the house directly abutting this march belongs to none other than Dr. Peter Hackett. Two days later, they found Shannon's remains, so Shannon was dead. And they were pretty much skeletal remains by this point. She was lying face up, no clothes, on the other side of Hackett's house in the marsh. He's proximate to them. Her remains and her clothes were fairly close to the remains of the ten bodies that had already been found. Yes, but police would say that her case was unrelated, which I can't quite understand why. No. If you found ten bodies in an area, and then you find an eleventh body about the same place, probably died the same way. Similar profession. Similar profession. Similar age. I might think that maybe there's a relationship. And a lot of people think that. They didn't have to do any DNA testing to identify her because, of course, they could see the titanium plate in her jaw, and that was enough to prove it was Shannon. Mary Gilbert believed that her daughter was killed by Hackett, but the police continued to disagree. They said it appeared that Shannon was trying to get out of that area and was overcome by the elements, either drowning or hypothermia. They really had no believable story, as far as I could tell. And they don't have a believable story about how her clothes were shedded a quarter mile from where her body was. No, they had suggested that maybe she was in this muck and her jeans got soaked and she took them off and kept walking. And I guess if she was mentally in a crisis, it's possible she did that. But to walk through there with no shoes would have been really difficult. She would have torn up her feet. It would have been almost impossible. So it seems more likely to me that she was dumped there. But she wasn't in the burlap sack like the other bodies. No. So there were some differences. Yeah, that's true. The four bodies were initially found, even before Shannon's body was found. Melissa Bartholomew, 24, of Erie County, New York, had been missing since July 2009. Megan Waterman, 22, of South Portland, Maine, had been missing since June 2010. Maureen Brainerd Barnes, 25, of Norwich, Connecticut, was last seen July of 2007. And Amber Lynn Costello, 27, of North Babylon, New York, had disappeared on September of 2010. All four women had been escorts who had advertised their services on the classified ad websites Craigslist and Backpage.com. The remains of each woman were found stuffed into individual rotting burlap sacks and autopsies later revealed that all the women had died of strangulation. Each of these victims had really difficult lives and died young, so I'd like to go over a couple of their situations. Melissa Bartholomew was 24 years old. She'd been missing for a year and a half when her body was found. Melissa came from a small town near Buffalo, New York. She attended beauty school, and she moved to New York City to work as a hairstylist. But Melissa began working as an escort in New York. After her mother, Lynn, had not heard from her for several days in mid-July of 2009, she began calling everyone she could think of searching for Melissa. Lynn also called the NYPD to file a missing persons report. For three days, the police refused to file the report because Melissa was an adult and she had no history of mental illness. Lynn even asked her attorney to get involved, but the police refused to assign a detective to her case for quite a long time. About a week later, Melissa's 15-year-old sister, Amanda, got a call from Melissa's cell phone. So she was excited when she picked up the phone, thinking Melissa's finally calling, thank God. But it was really terrifying because it was a man on the other end of the phone. So that was quite shocking. Remember, this is a 15-year-old girl whose sister is missing. So this man was described as emotionless and soft-spoken, 
and he said horrible things to Amanda about what he'd done to her sister and what he wanted to do to her, making threats to her. Police would grow to believe that this caller was the killer. Amanda received eight calls from him. Her mom, Lynn, spoke to him on one of these calls, and he claimed to be from the NYPD, asking her if she had filed a missing persons report. But for the most part, these calls were aimed at terrorizing Amanda. And Verizon eventually was able to trace his calls to the Manhattan area, but he always hung up before they could get further identification. The NYPD believed that this man was the Long Island serial killer. His voice led investigators to believe that he was a white male in his 20s to 30s, and criminal profilers believed that he would continue to kill women until he was stopped. According to psychologist and profiler Scott Bond, based on the principles of behavioral profiling, the Long Island serial killer is most likely a white male. He's probably married or has a girlfriend. He's well-educated, technologically adept, and well-spoken. He could even be quite charming. He's financially secure, has a reliable job, and owns a car or truck. And some people have considered that the killer could be employed in law enforcement because the phone calls were made from crowded places and lasted less than three minutes. That's not just knowledge known to police officers or law enforcement officers. No, not nowadays. So, Everybody watches crime shows and knows a lot about it. And there were also some signs that he was familiar with how the investigations unfolded. Yeah, it did seem that way, but that doesn't mean that he has to be in law enforcement. It's a possibility. But if he'd been killing for all these years, he probably had some knowledge about what he was doing, because he'd been getting away with it for a long time. They believe he doesn't currently live on or near Ocean Parkway on the south shore of Long Island, and they think he's very familiar with the area, though, and may have once lived there. He's a very careful and meticulous person and knows how to cover his tracks. He could have lived in Manhattan because that's where the calls to Amanda came from, and he may have been a Long Island summer visitor, so maybe he was a summer person. Two of the defining characteristics of this type of psychopathic serial killer are compulsive or cyclical violent behavior and the ability to blend back into their so-called normal lives between the killings. And this guy seemed to have a definite M.O. And his victims had a lot in common, mostly sex workers in their 20s. In Shannon Gilbert's case, her skeletal remains were found in a marsh, so investigators believed that she drowned there or succumbed to the elements, just a short time after she met Joe Brewer. But Brewer was cleared as a suspect in the case as well. After a state autopsy in December of 2014, the cause of Shannon's death was determined to be inconclusive, so she was never included on the official list of the serial killer victims. But then there was a new autopsy performed by former New York medical inspector Michael Baden. He was hired by Mary. Mary actually raised some money to hire him. And he said there was evidence that she was possibly strangled, making her possibly the 11th victim. But his findings are based on two missing horns on Shannon's hyoid bone. So I wanted to discuss that with you a little bit. Well, the hyoid bone is a bone in the neck, right? Yeah, kind of like a horseshoe shape. And it's one that we often hear about in, in people that have been strangled, that the hyoid bone has been fractured by the strangulation. So it has a body and it has two pairs of horns. And each horn is called a cornu, which is the Latin word for horn. The greater and lesser horns fuse to the body of the hyoid bone between 40 and 60 years of age, although non-fusion has been found even after the age of 60. Now, because Shannon was in her 20s, we have to wonder if the missing horns really indicate that she was strangled. It simply could be missing from her skeletal remains because of her age. Right. So what do you think about that? I mean, remember, he was hired by Shannon's mother, who is very sure that Shannon was murdered. So there's a little bit of pressure there for him to go in that direction Probably. with his findings. But the body of the hyoid wasn't broken. No. He's basing all these findings on these horns that are absent. 
Yes. I mean, Which, in his defense, I think he said possibly strangled. He didn't say that she was strangled. Right. Although the attorney for the family played it up as, oh, look, the initial autopsy was mishandled and she really was strangled. Exactly. So I don't know if that's that solid of evidence to me. I think it's pretty weak. Yeah, but at the same time, do I really think that a woman in her 20s went out there and drowned in a swamp or in the marsh? Well, I I would believe that more if I was more positive that she was acting under the influence of some drug or something. Mm-hmm. Then I could find it maybe a little more believable. Yeah. But otherwise, no, it's tough for a, a otherwise healthy woman to do that. Right. And why would she take her clothes off? So you've got the excuse of maybe her jeans got all wet. Okay. But why would she take her shirt off and wouldn't she put her shoes back on so her feet didn't get cut up? So it really is still a mystery what happened to Shannon. She wouldn't take everything off. I would not think so. I think we really don't know what happened to her. No, we don't. No. All right. Break time. Let's hear from our sponsors. Okay. I'd like to tell our listeners about one of my favorite beauty products, Madison Reed. You can take coloring your hair at home to the next level with Madison Reed. Madison Reed gives you gorgeous, professional hair color that's delivered to your door for less than $25. Madison Reed hair color is one of a kind because it's multidimensional and gives you your choice of over 45 multitonal shades that have been developed by master colorists who really know how to blend the nuances of cool, warm, light, and dark. Many of our listeners have written to tell me how Madison Reed hair color has improved their lives, and I get it. Madison Reed delivers gray coverage, and it also gives you natural-looking hair color. Another great thing is they bring it to my door when I want it, as often or as rarely as I want it delivered. So now I'm free from the long salon visits, and I'm saving money, and my hair looks and feels better than ever. It's soft, it's strong, it's a natural color, giving me one less thing to worry about. So that's why I'm always happy to recommend Madison Reed to our listeners. It's affordable, it's convenient, and it's great quality. We're busy women, so don't we deserve gorgeous professional hair color delivered to our doors on our schedule for less than $25? Hell yes, we do. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. And True Crime Brewery listeners get 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit by using the code BREWERY. That's code BREWERY at madison-reed.com. And another product I'm happy to endorse today is Native Deodorant. Native creates safe, simple, and effective products that you can use daily and feel good about. Their products are filled with ingredients found in nature, like coconut oil, shea butter, and tapioca starch. As a cancer survivor, I've made the choice to avoid products that contain aluminum, parabens, and talc. And I really like the natural scents that come in Native Deodorant. My favorite is coconut and vanilla. It's also easy to use. It's a solid stick that dries quickly, so no fuss there. But the best thing about Native is that it really does work. It can get you through your workouts, your long days at work, and even the rigors of motherhood. And Native comes in a wide variety of yummy scents for both men and women. Like I mentioned, coconut and vanilla. They also have lavender and rose, cucumber and mint, and eucalyptus and mint. There's even an unscented formula and a baking soda-free formula. There's no risk to try Native because they offer free returns and exchanges in the U.S. If you choose to subscribe to Native, you can save $2 per stick and have your favorite scent delivered on your own schedule. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code BREWERY during checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com with the promo code BREWERY to get 20% off your first purchase. Back to the episode. So another victim of the Long Island serial killer was Amber Costello. She disappeared in September of 2010 and had been missing for nearly three months before her body was found. She lived within 10 miles from the killer's dumping ground. Amber was a survivor of child sexual abuse. So some survivors of childhood sexual abuse avoid sex completely, but others reopen their wounds over and over like they think they can desensitize themselves. For Amber, sex became a way to get some power and control in her life. By the time she was a teen, sex meant nothing to her emotionally. 
When she was 16, she started charging some of the neighborhood boys for sex. Then Amber got a reputation when a rumor went around that she was spreading gonorrhea to the boys. So as she reached adulthood, she became addicted to drugs and continued to work in the sex trade. When Amber disappeared, she was living with a male friend named Dave Schaller. She worked as an escort and a prostitute, getting her clients through Backpage.com. Dave last saw her when she left their home to meet a client. She'd gotten this call from a stranger. They'd negotiated over sex and agreed on a much higher than usual price of $1,500. So this offer was just irresistible to Amber. She was addicted to heroin and she was supporting herself through prostitution. So she threw caution to the wind that night and she headed out alone. And sadly, she would never return. For safety reasons, she'd been using Dave's cell phone to set up dates. And on that evening, Dave would remember, the man called her three or four times. But she seemed to feel comfortable with him. Now his last call to her came at 10.30 p.m., and she left the house wearing a pink hoodie and a pair of jeans. Dave knew that Amber took risks, but as a close friend, he had learned to accept it. In her ads, Amber described herself as a southern belle and her picture showed a petite young woman with green eyes and brown hair. Amber would go out and buy a new ad every few days in order to keep herself at the top of the adult services section. And if she got an out call to a hotel or a house, Dave would usually drive her and wait outside in his car. But more often, clients would come to their house. And in that case, Dave could wait in the next room in case she needed him. Well, there had been times when men did threaten violence, and Dave had had to intervene. Amber was so tiny, she was 4 feet 11 and weighed about 100 pounds. But she was tough, she wasn't afraid of too much. On the morning of September 3rd, when Amber hadn't gotten back home, Dave called her sister. But the sister told him not to worry, because that's just Amber, she takes off all the time. So he waited. You know, it's just so sad because of her lifestyle. No one in her family reported her missing or even looked for her. They'd pretty much given up on her, which is so sad. She was only 27 years old. Yeah, and somehow the killer convinced Amber to meet him alone. She was experienced and she should know better. But at the same time, he offered a lot of money and seemed to have put her at ease. And don't forget, she had a drug habit. I know, but I would think that that persistence and that offer of so much money would be a red flag to her. It probably should have been. It's like too good to be true type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But then at the same time, you're thinking, wow, what can I buy drug-wise with this amount of money? Right. I mean, $1,500 is a lot of money. That could get you through a couple weeks. It could pay her rent, get her drugs. Yeah. So money went out over reason. And I'm sure the killer knew this, right? I mean, of course. He knew that these women are desperate for money. He he knows the right things to say. And if he's an educated, soft-spoken man, he could probably put them at ease and offer them so much money they can't resist. And then murdered them. Another one of these victims was from Portland, Maine. Her name was Megan Waterman. She disappeared in June of 2010 and she was last seen leaving a Holiday Inn Express. Now, a really interesting thing about that is that is that this was the same hotel where a client had asked Amber Costello to meet him just a few weeks before Amber was killed, but Amber had refused to do that that time. So it turns out it's probably the same man. Megan was the youngest of these women that was murdered. She was just 22 years old, and she left behind a four-year-old daughter. She'd been raised by her grandmother, Muriel. Muriel had raised her own six children on her own in downtown Portland, Maine. And early on, Muriel had decided that her daughter, Lorraine, was the bad one. So Lorraine became the black sheep of that family. But the designation wasn't completely unearned, because Lorraine did get in a lot of trouble. She'd been on her own for a month when she met Megan's father, Greg Gove. And these two really didn't have anything in common, but Lorraine had never had a boyfriend before. So she was really into him, and within a month they moved in together. They rented a room in a dodgy section of Portland. Then they ended up staying at a Days Inn in Westbrook, renting a room by the week. 
Lorraine had begun to drink a lot after getting together with Greg. And then the relationship became very volatile, and he became physically abusive. Then Lorraine became pregnant. She left Greg, but returned to him when they had their first baby, and that was a boy who they named Greg Jr. They broke up again when she was eight months pregnant with their second daughter, and that was Megan. And as that pregnancy advanced, she quit her job at Burger King, and she got on welfare. When Megan was born, she had an elevated bilirubin level, and that's something that needs to be monitored. Lorraine was supposed to bring the baby back for a follow-up test, but she kept avoiding the social workers and didn't follow through. So Muriel became alarmed that the state couldn't find Lorraine. And finally, she learned that Megan was in the hospital with respiratory distress. And that's when Muriel applied for custody of Megan, saying that Lorraine was an unfit mother. So she's an infant, a newborn, and elevated bilirubin levels are pretty common in babies usually to no degree of concern. Well, because it's easily treated. Well, you have to recognize it and know what to do. Right, and that's why she needed to bring the baby back for a recheck. Exactly. So when babies are born, they have more red blood cells than they need once they start breathing with their lungs. So the red cells are broken down. One of the byproducts of the breakdown is bilirubin, which is a yellow pigment. Now that's supposed to be metabolized by the liver, but a newborn's liver isn't always up quite up to the task. So you get bilirubin staying in the bloodstream. And that's what gives the, the orangey-yellow skin color to the babies. By itself, that's not a concern. But if some of the bilirubin, uh, the bilirubin that's not bound to any proteins in the blood, can cross into the brain, it can cause brain damage. So that's the concern. Yeah, so in the old days, babies did get brain damage. Yeah, it's called carnicterus. So as long as you recognize it, and the treatment is, is just simply putting the baby under what looks like fluorescent lights, that metabolizes the bilirubin. And kind of worst case scenario, if the bilirubin is very high, you can do a transfusion and exchange red blood cells for bilirubin. Which is pretty rare. It is. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a few back in the day, but hadn't done any or hadn't wanted to do any, really needed to do any for about 30 years at the time I retired. So, Well, that's because it's routinely checked. So it it's is. caught I mean, early. There's, there's all sorts of protocols for it. Sure. So it, it, it should not ever happen, provided there's follow-up. So that's the concern back when Megan was an infant, that they had no way of following her up. Well, and then she ended up with respiratory distress, and we don't know much more about how that happened. Do you want to add anything about newborns and respiratory distress? I know that could be many different causes. That's too generic a term. So respiratory distress could be an infection that's causing her lungs to have problems. could be heart disease that makes you breathe fast. could be other diseases. Uh, there's, there's so many things. So respiratory distress is kind of a generic term for what happens with a sick baby. Well, yeah, but with a newborn, there really is blood work that needs to be done in a case like that. Right, but she was in the hospital, so presumably she was being tested for those possibilities. Well, yeah, by the time she was in the hospital, but I just wonder how far that baby got before she ended up in the hospital, because it seems like Lorraine was pretty careless, not really on top of things. Not well, we know that. So this is another case, I guess I'm just saying, that I give the grandmother credit. I think she did the right thing. She did. Yeah. So we know that the state has foster care ready for these emergency situations. So when little Megan left the hospital, she, along with her brother Greg, were taken from Lorraine and placed in foster care. But Muriel would drive every Sunday morning to visit the babies. They were about an hour away. Lorraine was supposed to go with them, but Muriel said they could never find her. So Muriel began to bond with her grandchildren and was kind of more like a mother than a grandmother. Yeah, and she befriended the foster family and asked for more time with the two babies. She wanted them all the time. Three months into foster care, the family let Muriel keep the babies for the entire week. Lorraine would come around from time to time, but she wasn't reliable, and Muriel grew to resent her, as did the children as they got older. So while Muriel really loved the children... Lorraine's sister has acknowledged that government support played a part in Muriel's decision to take them. 
Her youngest son was turning 18, and she'd be losing state aid. So if she assumed the care of her grandkids, she'd get assistance. Yes. And that's one of the first things she did when the kids came to her house to live, was to apply for assistance. Sure. But I can't I can't fault her for that. Well, no, I mean, if she loves them and she needs the state aid to take care of them, more power to her. Our government has spent money on a lot stupider things than taking care of children, so I'm all for that. You bet. So Muriel raised Megan and her brother as if they were her own children. Their father, Greg, did visit the children for a few years, but then he left town and disappeared on them. Lorraine did see them too, but only when Muriel would allow it. And this was a point of contention, you know. There was some not great relationship things going on between Muriel and Lorraine. So many of Megan's closest friends, as she got older, didn't even know that she had a mother. And those that knew, knew that Megan hated her. But Megan had quite the childhood. She was not an easy child. No, she wasn't. She was pretty hostile and out of control. First time the police were called about her was when she was in first grade. How about that? Amazing. There was a bridge connecting some buildings 30 feet above the sidewalk. And she climbed over the railing and wouldn't come back. And by second grade, she was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. She stayed at this elementary school until fifth grade, then she was transferred to a school for troubled kids. By the time she reached her teens, Muriel had become too frightened of Megan to regain control of her. Megan would make threats to her grandmother like, I'll kill you in your sleep, I'll stab you to death. So this was just beyond dysfunctional. Megan was a really unhappy child. She was angry and resentful from feeling like she wasn't getting what she deserved in life. When she was in junior high, Muriel moved the family from downtown Portland to Scarborough, which is pretty much a nice area, a nice suburb. A lot of wealthy people there. But they had a trailer on the western side of town in a trailer park. A single wide mobile home, 14 by 70 feet with three bedrooms. And Megan felt resentful. Why did these other kids at school have more than her? She decided right away that most of the people in Scarborough were snobs. And because Megan came from the trailer park, she was identified as white trash. She started in regular classrooms, but she soon was transferred to special ed. And when she started Scarborough High School the following year, she was put in the alternative part of the school for troubled kids. On many, many occasions, Megan was caught shoplifting from Walmart, and she ended up in the youth center, which is a jail for young offenders. She was released, but soon caught carrying drug paraphernalia, so she was eventually forced into juvenile rehab. Then when she was 17, Megan stopped going to school. She did continue to live at home with Muriel, and she started working these low-paying jobs. She got picked up by police a few times for shoplifting and possession of alcohol. Then when she was 17, Megan found out she was pregnant. The father was a 32-year-old DJ who Megan had met at a club in Portland. They had had sex in the bathroom. It's just so sad. Isn't it? It really is. A judge in youth court ordered Megan to stay at St. Andre's, which is a home for unwed mothers, for the length of a pregnancy. And just as a side note, I worked there for quite a while, taking care of pregnant teens. What a rewarding job. I really enjoyed it. I mean, most of these young women were really trying hard to get better lives, and a lot of them came from a lot of shit, so it was a great place. But anyway, Megan had her baby girl in the summer of 2006 and named her Liliana. When she went home to Muriel's trailer, she seemed different. She seemed determined to straighten up her life for her baby. But Megan began to feel some new pressure and a lot of disappointment. The money she got from the state wasn't enough to feed and clothe her, and the baby, and she didn't want a future of living off government checks like her mom and her grandmother had done. Megan wanted to give her daughter a better future, but she made the wrong decision on how to reach that goal because she ended up buying ads on Craigslist and working as an escort. You know, and I bet a lot of that is because she didn't have guidance. If your parents and grandparents have never gone to college or really been able to do a lot in the outside world, how are they going to advise you to do that. So it's really a disadvantage just as much as poverty is. Well, that's for sure. And, you know, you always got to think it's not just the money, but in in a sense, 
the ease of making the money. Well, yeah, it's the ease of the money, but in the long run, it's not easy. I mean, you're putting your life at risk. I know that, but when you're 17 or whatever, and then you're thinking, how can I make a good amount of money? That's an easy way to do it. Well, I don't like the word easy. It's a quick way. Okay. There aren't as many steps to take as going to college and filling out job applications and going to interviews. But what I'm saying is there's nobody who taught her how to do that anyway. So she was really on her own. Right. I mean, there wasn't anyone to say, here's an idea. Right. And these girls seem like they were smart girls for the most part who could have accomplished a lot of things. So it's just really the whole disadvantage that comes with poverty. It's a lot more than just not having the money. It's not having a lot of things that can help you succeed in adulthood. So I think Megan's case is really a sad one. Well, they all are. Well, sure. Megan's boyfriend usually accompanied her to meet clients, but she was convinced to meet a client alone on the night that she disappeared, just as the other young women had. Now, can I just ask a question about these boyfriends who drive them there? What the fuck is with that? What, you mean the driving? Well, not just the driving, but why would you take your girlfriend to have sex with men and then use that money and not feel bad about it? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I think that's why I'm asking it. They're probably messed up in the same way. Okay. I mean, two of these girls had boyfriends. Actually, the other one did too. I think all of them did have a boyfriend of some kind, yeah. But two of them had boyfriends that would actually drive them to their dates. I mean, that's just beyond me. I know. Well, not only that they do it, but me as a woman, if my boyfriend had said, yeah, I'll drive you out there so you could be an escort or you could give blowjobs or whatever the details of it were, I'd be, well, fuck you, buddy. Why would I want to go out with someone that wants me to do that, that doesn't think enough of me? It's almost like they're the pimp. Oh, sure. Very close to that. Yeah. I guess they don't take as high a percentage as a pimp would, but still, it's disturbing. So the last victim we want to concentrate on today is Maureen, Maureen Brainerd Barnes, who was 25 years old, and she was from Norwich, Connecticut. She was last seen in July of 2007. So Maureen, here's that old familiar story. She dropped out of school when she was 16 and pregnant, and she never went back. By the time she had disappeared, she she had had two children, each with a different father. When she was unable to afford her own apartment, Marina would stay at her sister's place for a while. Maureen moved into an apartment in Norwich, Connecticut, that was paid for her by her son's father. Maureen told her friends that she didn't like being dependent on her ex. Yeah, well, she was never a girly girl, I guess, but she developed early and was noticed by the boys in school at a young age. She had been with her boyfriend, Jason Brainerd Barnes, for just six months when she got pregnant with her first child. He asked her to marry him, and she said yes, and they had a small ceremony at the courthouse in 1999, and that was after Maureen gave birth to their daughter, Caitlin. So they moved into Jason's grandparents' place, and then they moved down south for two years when Jason joined the army. But after they returned to Connecticut, the marriage fell apart. Maureen ended up moving in with her sister, Missy, and Missy's children, who lived in a low-income housing development. Missy was the more practical sister, but Maureen was the one that everybody just adored. She was a dreamer and a romantic. So some parts of reality were hard for her to accept. The best job she had as a card dealer at Foxwoods Casino ended in a little less than a year when she started calling in sick too much. For a while, she delivered pizzas, and she worked the register at a local drugstore. But then she started leaving her daughter with Missy and going out on the town. Maureen was an excellent writer, though, and she filled multiple notebooks with poetry and rap lyrics. And there's a book that I'm going to tell everyone about at the end of this episode, where they actually have some of her writing in it, which was really very good. I was impressed with her writing. In 2003, Maureen was 21, and she had a four-year-old daughter, no job, and no place of her own to live. Her music and songwriting wasn't giving her the attention that she'd hoped for. She'd been using MySpace to market her music and to network with some other rappers. And that's when she came across some ads for modeling. She got a friend to take some photos for her, and she wore a few different dresses and a lacy nightgown in the photos. But, I mean, they were far from pornographic. 
Maureen got dozens of emails from places claiming to be legitimate modeling agencies, but after a few clicks, they would turn out to be hiring nude models only, or they would be escort services in disguise, aka prostitution rings. So while clicking on some of these links, Maureen did notice how much money she could make as a sex worker or an escort. But she didn't want to share the money with an agency. So on Craigslist, Maureen saw women had posted ads independently. And she thought, well, gee, that's a good idea. So she began to advertise her services online. And the money she earned was more than she could earn at any of the jobs that she was qualified to do. Over the next few years, she would leave the sex trade for months at a time, so she was trying to get away from it, but she was always drawn back in by the money. So when she went to meet that client that last day, she'd been served an eviction notice and she was really desperate to make some money. And he had convinced her to come out and meet him, and he was going to pay her $1,500. So she was last seen in July 2007, saying that she planned to spend the day in New York City. And after her disappearance, a friend of hers named Sarah Carnes received a call from a man from an unknown number. The man claimed that he had just seen Maureen and that she was alive and staying at a whorehouse in Queens. He refused to identify himself and he could not tell Sarah the location of the house. He told her he would call her back and give her the address, but he never called again. But this just turned out to be someone who was a sicko, I guess, because she wasn't in a whorehouse in Queens. We know that. No, but it might have been the killer. Yeah, no one has suggested that that was the killer, but that's possible, yeah. Well, where did he get the phone? Well, we don't know. It was an unknown number, so it wasn't Maureen's phone. Where did he get the number? I don't know. Maybe it was listed. And with the other girl, he had actually used the missing girl's phone. Yeah. Yeah. But how would he know? I mean, even if he had like a burner phone or something, how would he know this specific girlfriend of hers? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point. He must have had some kind of knowledge of, or knew them. It could be someone who just knew them. In June of 2011, the Suffolk County Police raised the reward for information leading to an arrest in these murders from $5,000 to $25,000, which was the largest reward ever offered in that department. And that November, investigators announced that they believed all 10 of those murders were done by the same person. Earlier, they had speculated that there may have been more than one killer, because there were some differences in the conditions of the victims. But at this point, investigators also stated that they didn't believe the case of Shannon Gilbert was related to these other deaths. Shannon's body had been found in a marsh about a half a mile from Oak Beach, which is where she disappeared from. Police believed that she had accidentally drowned after stumbling into a swamp in a drug-induced panic. And the autopsy by Michael Baden concluded that her death and decomposition were not consistent with drowning. Baden concluded that her autopsy findings would be consistent with strangulation. And we've talked about her hyoid bone and why he said that. But despite these findings, authorities still do not believe that her death is related to the Long Island serial killer, and they still consider her death to be an accident. In a really tragic twist to the Gilbert family's story, Shannon Gilbert's mom, Mary, was found stabbed to death in younger daughter Sarah's apartment, in July of 2016. This 27-year-old daughter, Sarah Gilbert, had been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and she was charged with the murder. She pleaded not guilty of the stabbing, but was found guilty of second-degree murder. Sarah had stabbed her mother with a 15-inch kitchen knife 227 times, then beat her with a fire extinguisher, sprayed her with the foam from the extinguisher, stripped off her clothing, and removed her jewelry. So this was a brutal, for lack of a better word, just crazy murder. Wasn't it? Over 200 times being stabbed? That's just a frenzy. It shows a lot of anger. Sure does. And then doing these other things afterwards. You know, the prosecution in the trial argued that Sarah plotted the killing and carried it out because Mary had Sarah arrested months earlier for killing a puppy and she had taken temporary custody of Sarah's son. The defense said that Sarah snapped because of delusions brought on by a lifetime of abuse and mental illness. The jury rejected the option it was given of finding her not responsible due to mental disease or defect, meaning that she was so mentally ill that she either didn't know or understand what she was doing, 
or what the consequences were. That rarely works. That really rarely works, that's for sure. Several jurors said they had no doubt that Sarah was mentally ill, but they didn't believe it was a severe enough mental illness to prevent her from knowing what she was doing was wrong. And they also believe that Sarah's drug abuse worsened her psychiatric issues. Well, sure, I can do that. Well, to the police and on the witness stand, Sarah said that her mother practiced witchcraft for most of her life and was a demon and an evil god. She also said that her mother was causing her to hear voices and to hallucinate. She said she stripped her mother because Mary was drawing power from her own blood and she wouldn't die. So that's a lot of tragedy for one family. Isn't it? It is. A lot of illness in that family. Well, in the 48 Hours episode about this case, you see Sarah at a younger age. Sweet girl, you know. Yes. Yeah, it's just shocking that this happened. One interesting comment I'd make, if the jury didn't have any doubt she was mentally ill, how are they going to judge how much mental illness is too much (laughs) mental illness? Wow, that's an excellent point. You know, they said, okay, she's mentally ill, but I guess not mentally ill enough. Well, no, I don't think they're qualified to judge that, but I think they have to decide if she knew that she was doing something wrong, and they decided that she did. Well, I'd submit that anybody who stabs another person over 200 times doesn't know or differentiate that. Well, I don't know. Some people know it's wrong and enjoy it. Then you're getting into speculation also. Well, sure. But I mean, the one thing I'd say to what you're saying there, Dick, is that I think she definitely should have been in a psychiatric hospital and not in prison. I'd certainly go with that. Yeah. And we know that this family had a lot of dysfunction in addition to any kind of mental illness she might have had. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's just really sad, that whole family. Breaks my heart. It is. I mean, to endure all that they went through, and then years later, your other daughter kills you. And her life is ruined, too. Yeah. So, on December 2015, the Suffolk County Police Department announced that the FBI had officially joined their Long Island serial killer investigation. And that was after they'd been unofficially helping the police in searches for these victims for several years. The investigators have now speculated that other bodies discovered in these areas of Long Island could be the work of the Long Island serial killer, although there isn't any hard evidence that links them. And among these other victims are the dismembered torso of an unidentified young African-American female that was found at Hempstead Lake State Park. Also, a suitcase containing the dismembered torso of an unidentified Hispanic or African-American person washed up on a beach in Mamaroneck. Tanya Rush, a 39-year-old from Brooklyn, her dismembered body was discovered in a suitcase on the side of the Southern State Parkway in Belmore, New York. Also, the remains of an Asian woman between the ages of 20 and 30 were found in a sandy area on Sheep Lane in Laddingtown. And a 31-year-old woman named Natasha Hugo, who disappeared after leaving her home in Queens. Her body washed up on Gilgo Beach in June of 2013. So we brought up Dr. Hackett as a suspect. What do you think about that? I mean, especially the Gilbert family really thought that he was responsible for Shannon's death. Well, it's very suspicious. And I know that they've said, or it's been said on things that we've researched, that he had a way of inserting himself into things like this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, That he was kind of a publicity hound. But still, there's a lot of questions. Well, yeah, calling Mary is very weird and denying it until it was proven. Yeah. And he said that contrary to rumors, no neighbors called him that night that Shannon went running down the street pounding on doors. Yeah. And he told the author of a great book about the case, which you're going to mention later, that he actually told Gus Coletti and Barbara Brennan that they should have called him that night, that he might have been able to help Shannon. Yeah, Hackett said that he would have treated Shannon if he'd seen her, but not that he had treated her. So Mary had claimed that Hackett told her over the phone that he ran a treatment center for young women and that he had treated Shannon. But it is possible that Hackett had said the same thing to Mary on the phone, not that he had helped Shannon, but that he wished he'd helped her. 
It could have been a misunderstanding. I mean, I don't know the extent of Mary's problems, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did do some drugs. No, I wouldn't. No. Still, that wouldn't explain Hackett denying ever speaking to Mary and then later admitting it after it was proven by phone records. Well, and even then he said, I can't recall the conversation. Yeah, in one interview he was like saying, can we just not deal with that right now or something? Yeah. I mean, I guess it could have been forgetfulness, but I'm more likely to think it was deception and I'm not sure the reasoning. I'm not sure if it's because he had done anything to Shannon, but it is questionable. I mean, in interviews, he really has continued to be very vague about that night and the phone call to Mary. And that's just not the kind of phone call you'd forget about. You know, it's a big deal. Wouldn't think so, right? Right. For one example, he claimed that the first time he heard anything about Shannon was several days after she disappeared. And that's when Alex Diaz and Michael Pock came to the neighborhood with flyers. Hackett claims that he told them to go to the local police where Shannon lived and to report her missing. And he gave them his card, told them he'd be happy to help if they needed anything. Yeah, he remembered thinking that from a police standpoint, this wasn't a little kid that was missing. She was a grown-up. So police might have thought she'd gone off somewhere on her own and would come back eventually and probably wouldn't act real fast on her being missing. Hackett said that the line of inquiry into him is totally ridiculous. He said, I'm a family practitioner, an emergency physician, a former director of emergency medicine for Suffolk County, New York, and then emergency department director at Central Suffolk Hospital. Can you imagine me putting my reputation on the line? Well, I can imagine it. Maybe he said something that Mary misinterpreted. You know, maybe he said something about how he works in emergency medicine and knows about rehab. Hackett did have some enemies in the neighborhood, so it's possible that they were happy enough to spread the word that he was involved in covering up a murder. But until the day that she died, Mary believed that Peter Hackett was Shannon's killer. So Shannon's case remains open. And as I said earlier, the Long Island serial killer is still at large. Yep, they don't appear to be any closer to solving this as they were years ago. No, I think the killer either moved away or died. Something happened. But, I mean, the killer could have moved away and could be doing this somewhere else. That's the scary part. Could be, because we know that they don't stop. Not usually, no. No. Not until they're very old or something happens, yeah. So to find out more about this case, the book that I mentioned earlier is called The Lost Girls, An American Unsolved Mystery, written by Robert Kolker. Very well written. I like the beginning part where you hear all the stories about these young women. Yeah, that's how he starts the book off. Yeah. The the backstory of every victim, well, every known victim. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that. There's also a 48 Hours episode on this called The Long Island Serial Killer. There's a People Magazine Investigates, also called The Long Island Serial Killer. TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Our new website launched last week, and it's pretty awesome. Thank you to Matt at Globotech for his coding expertise. For our Team Tie Grabber members, unfortunately, we do need you to go to the website and update your payment information. We weren't able to find a way around that, but I'll put the link in our show notes in case you didn't get my email. It's pretty simple. You just need to click on the link, reset your password, and under My Account, you choose Change Payment to enter your information. You can still use PayPal, but you also now have the option to use a credit card. For anyone who wants to join, the process has really been simplified now, and it's quite seamless. We have over 30 members-only episodes available now, and next week we will be releasing our August members-only episode on John List, who killed his entire family and disappeared for many, many years. There were some really weird motivations behind these crimes, and we're really going to try and delve into his mind and how this very religious, supposedly close-knit family was callously snuffed out. So to join, just go to tiegrabber.com and click on subscribe. We now have options to join with monthly, quarterly, or annual plans. And another new feature is that new members get to choose their welcome gift. You can choose a snifter or a steel wallet-sized bottle opener or a set of four coasters. And I'm also prone to throwing in stickers and magnets with our welcome gifts before I mail them out. 
We also are adding a new feature, which is an email newsletter. In this newsletter, which I'll start in September, I want to keep everyone up to speed on what we're producing for content, um, include some updates on cases we've covered, and we'll be inviting true crime authors, listeners, and others to contribute articles or updates from the true crime genre. You can sign up for the newsletter at tiegrabber.com, and that is absolutely free. So we're moving on for a short feedback segment. If you'd like to leave us a voicemail, just go to tiegrabber.com and click on the Leave a Voicemail tab on the home page. Or you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery.com or leave us a message on social media. We're on Twitter at TieGrabberPods, and you can find us on Instagram and Facebook as Tigrabber Podcasts. We also have a closed group you're welcome to join if you want on Facebook. It's called the True Crime Brewery Fan Discussions page, and many of our listeners are very active on there. There's all kinds of true crime things on there and also some funny stuff. It's a fun place to visit. So now on to feedback. First, we have a voicemail from Narelle. Hi, Dick and Jill. It's Narelle calling from Australia. Uh, I just wanted to say I've been listening to your podcast. This is my third year into it now. Uh, I love it. In fact, um, when I can't listen to it in the car on the way to work, I get really annoyed. I have just been reading an article about a guy called Christopher Wilder, and he was born in Australia. He is suspected of the unsold unsolved murders of two schoolgirls at Sydney's Wanda Beach in 1965 and I come from Sydney in Australia and I was born the year after those well the start of the Wanda Beach murders and they were really well known when I was a teenager in fact we would go to the beach catch the train down to Cronulla which is two beaches down from Wanda and my mum would always tell us you know don't go up to Wanda Beach because that's where you get murdered and so we were really scared to walk two beaches up to Wanda uh, because of how well known it was that that's where all those murders happened back in the uh, mid to late 1960s and at that time really um, no one had been arrested or, or known for those murders but over the years this guy Christopher Wilder um, was a suspect. Anyway the, the reason I was interested is that he took off to the States over your way in 1969 and he was then on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list because he went on a sort of murderous rampage that lasted 15 years over there. So uh, he eventually, I think, shot himself in a car in the US after 47 days where he murdered and preyed on 12 women. He was called the Beauty Queen Killer, I think, and there's a couple of books and a movie, um, The Snapshot Killer. But the reason he was in our our magazines here is there's just been a a well-known journalist called Andrew Byrne who's written a book called The Pretty Girl Killer, and I think it has a few more uh, clues as to why they think he was now one of the Wanda Beach murderers or the Wanda Beach murderer back in the late 60s here. So quite an interesting case. I'd love to know more about it. I'd love to hear you do an episode on it. And, you know, as it sh- shares Australia and the US, it'd be great to hear. Thanks and keep on doing what you're doing. I love it. I love your little banter. Sometimes you sound like Aussies when you banter on like that, especially when you drop a few F word, F words. She reached her three minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then right. she didn't call back. So that, that okay. was the end of Narelle's discussion. All right. Well, thank you for your voicemail, Narelle. I really like how her mother didn't beat around the bush and gave it straight to the kids. Yeah. Don't go to Wanda Beach because you'll, you'll be murdered. Stay you away know, from that. I like that. This is an interesting case. I want to read the book, but other than the fact that Wilder was in the Wanda Beach area at the time of the killings, there didn't seem much to link him to that other than the fact that he did all these killings in the U.S. So it would be something to look into. Yes, I remember reading a little bit about it, and it was quite a mystery. It is, and we saw a documentary about it, too, about the Wanda Beach murders. We did when we were looking into the Beaumont children. Yeah. That caught our eye, yeah. So, yeah, we definitely will look into that one. And he was apprehended in Claremont, New Hampshire, and was shot by the police. Good case. All right. Karen. Karen, this is off of a YouTube suggestion, and it was a very succinct request. Could you do Donna <laughs> Scrivo? 
This is a mother who killed her adult son. Unbelievable. Okay, this is not one I've ever heard of. Yeah, and this is not too long ago, uh, 2015. She went on trial for the murder and dismemberment of her son. She was a witness on her own behalf, and she told the jury that a man in a mask had entered their condo, pointed a gun at her head, murdered her son, and cut up the victim's body with a saw. Jesus. Which is what had happened, although she was found guilty. So what do we have that makes us think she'd want to kill her son? Well, the son was schizophrenic and often on meds and eventually ended up living with his mother in her condo. I think I did read about this case a while back. I think from what I saw, she had found her old high school sweetheart online and wanted to be with him and killed her son. Of course, it could have been a different mother who killed her son, I'm thinking of. That's possible. It sounds similar. Well, thanks for the suggestion, Karen. It's a good one. It is. We have another YouTube suggestion from Naima Aziz. Another succinct one. It is. Can you do the Christian Aguilar case? We've seen this documentary. This is the one you got to remember at the <laughs> University of Florida. People in Gainesville is a lover's triangle. Oh, yes. He was murdered by his best friend. Yeah, this was on 2020 or 48 hours or something. Yeah. That was a weird case. Yeah. It was. So that might be worth looking into. Sure. Yeah. Good suggestion. And then another case suggestion from Rosemary. Rosemary wrote, You both have soothing voices. Enjoy listening to you. I was wondering if you ever did or want to do the Carolyn Worms trial. I was working in White Plains, New York at the time in 1990 near the courthouse. It was a sensational trial and there were two TV movies made of it. I love a good TV movie. Absolutely. So Carolyn is an American former elementary school teacher who was convicted when she was 28 of the 1989 murder of her lover's wife, 40-year-old Betty Jean Solomon. After a hung jury at her first trial in 1991, Warmus was convicted of second-degree murder and illegal possession of a firearm at her second trial in 1992. She served 27 years for the murder and was finally released from prison on June 17, 2019. So Warmus was incarcerated in New York, and she received multiple affirmed disciplinary events, which were referenced during her first parole denial, which was in 2017. And that same year, she claimed her innocence and asked that glove evidence discovered by her ex-lover, Paul Solomon, between the first and second trials, be tested for DNA. But she hasn't been able to get that tested, I guess. No, she didn't. So this case attracted national attention, and it was compared with the 87 film Fatal Attraction, about a love affair that turns deadly. You know, I thought that movie was really kind of horrific when I first saw it, but I watched it a few weeks ago, and I was like, eh, some movies (laughs) just don't hold up, you know? I guess not. 30 years later, Fatal Attraction is just just, too tame. Yeah, it is. You can watch better Lifetime movies now that have more intrigue. But it did inspire some made-for-TV movies and six different episodes on multiple television networks, and at least one book. Pretty big case. Might be worth covering. It might be. Her ex-lover turned out to be this real scum. He, he was a, also a school teacher. When she was charged, he dropped old Carolyn and started screwing another teacher. And uh, eventually he was asked to leave school, or at least was relief from teaching duties because he'd had multiple affairs with multiple teachers. Well, hey, at least he wasn't hitting on the students. Not that we know of. That's true. Yeah. All right. Anyway, great suggestions. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate you writing in and leaving your voicemails for us. Our favorite part of the day. Yes. So we're going to get to work on some new members-only content now that we have our wonderful new website. Yeah, check it out. It's really cool. Well, it works a lot better. I know that. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. So until next time, we'll be at the quiet end. Drinking our beer. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye.